They say that falling in love is wonderful. It's wonderful, so they say. And with the moon up above, it's wonderful. It's wonderful. So they tell me, you wake up some morning and without any warning, you're meeting people shouting that love is grand. Love is grand. And to hold a girl in your arms is wonderful. Who is they? What do you mean they say? They're out to get me. That's the way they are. They. Who is they? Last time I spoke with you, we talked about who I am in Christ who we are in Christ. Isn't that right? So it's important to know who God is. Jesus. We just sang about the Lord. He's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now and ever shall be. Unto ages of ages. Amen. So we need to know who God is, but we need to know who we are and we never know who we are until we know who he is. As we look into him, as we gaze into him, we begin to realize who we are in the light of who he is. The things that are not pleasing to him are so clear when we're looking directly into him. And the things that are pleasing to him become so clear to us. And we feel good and bad all at the same time. But at least we got the truth. Now, it's important to know not only who God is, but who we are, but also it's important to know who is they. Pogo says, we has met the enemy and they is us. <laughs> but really, who are they? That's what I want to talk about. Who are they? Well, when we say they, we're not talking about the crickets, we're talking about people. So who are they? They come in all varieties. And if we would try to figure out what is the one common denominator, is there any commonality between us and they? They're not all Christians, are they? Those who are Christians are not all strong, are they? There, there's just so much variety. What's the commonality? The commonality is that we're all created by God. We're all created by the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, not everybody's been recreated or in the process of being reformed or reshaped into the image of Jesus. But everybody who is at all, anybody who exists, was created by God. When I, when I was at the University of Michigan, uh, that's the one in Ann Arbor, not the Cal College. I got it for that in northern Michigan one summer. I walked off with a green hat. <clears throat> when I was at the University of Michigan uh, getting my master's in music ed, I had, there was a Jewish family there, a man and his wife and a little son. And he, I think, was taking some music courses. I, I think he was majoring in composition. And I was taking a, a course in composition. And uh, 
that's how we met. I'm just remembering that right now. And uh, so he asked, would I uh, be willing to give his son clarinet lessons? And so for a number of months, uh, I would go over to their apartment on Saturday morning, I guess it was, and teach this little boy clarinet lessons. And we became good friends, and the father and the mother and the son and I, we all became good friends. And I loved them. And they knew it. And, uh, of course, they paid me for the lessons, uh, lesson by lesson. But when it was over and the year was ending and they had to fly back to Israel, and I was continuing on through the summer to complete my requirements, uh, we had our last clarinet lesson and they presented me with a gift. And the gift was um, um, a, a hardbound uh, book full of photographs and it was called The Family of Man. And you know, back about, it must be 30 years or so, The Family of Man, beautiful photographs of people from all over the world, all different kinds of people. The Family of Man and a lovely inscription in there. I still have it. It means a lot to me because it, it indicates that this Jewish family realized that I love them. And I know that they love me. I mean, it was just uh, very clear to all of us that that's what was happening. And I never forgot that. The family of man, the family of man. That's the only family I knew about at that time, except my own family, and then the family of man. Now, of course, some people believe in the fatherhood of God and the family of man. That's universalism, and that ain't where it's at. There's more to it than that. But nevertheless, that does exist. There is a relationship. When we look at each other, we don't, we, we, we're aware that we're human beings. We're aware that we have a relationship that I don't have with my dog, mainly because I don't have a dog. But if I did, it wouldn't be the same kind of relationship that I have with people. You, we just recognize, oh, there's one of us. But we talk about they. Now, within this family of man, there are families. They have different last names. Some of them are named McCullough. And some of them who are named McCullough get their name changed to Bolin. <laughs> or Ramirez. And some of you had a family name and you left your father and mother and cleaved to your spouse and you got a different family name. Some of you kept the same family name you had, male types, but you're not the same family anymore. I'm not Mitch and Beck's little boy. I have a different identity. I'm Alice's slave, I mean husband. <laughs> We're Alex and Alice McCullough. That's a different thing. You got to leave in order to cleave. But when that happens, you become one flesh, a new flesh. Whether you ever have children or not, this is a different family. Identity. So we have all these family names. I don't think God minds that. There were many Jesuses, even in his day. Yeshua. It's the name that we call Joshua, like Yahweh. We call it Jehovah. It's not Jehovah, it's Yahweh. It's a Hebrew name, Yahweh, Yahweh. And there was Yeshua. There were many of them. But one special one that they knew was from Nazareth, they referred to as the one who was from Nazareth, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus of Joseph and Mary. Isn't he the carpenter's son? He's a carpenter's son. Well, who does he think he is? We know who he is. That's Jesus of Nazareth. That's a carpenter's son. Their, their names, Nam, Nam de Plume, a writer's name. 
Jesus doesn't mind that we have different names. That doesn't have to separate us. Just because your last name is Crawford and my last name is McCullough, that doesn't mean that we aren't members of, of God's family of man. We're human beings. And when we hug each other, it's different than when I used to hug my collie dog named Pal. It's almost as good as that was. <laughs> Not as hairy. But there, there is that special thing. Now, of course, there's, there's also the family of God, which is not the same as the family of man. The family of man is born of man. The family of God is born of God. And that's why it's called the family of God. They have names, too. Presbyterian. <laughs> Baptist. Lutheran. Methodist, Episcopalian, Assembly of God, Disciples of Christ. I know I'm going to get into trouble. I'm not going to remember them all. Give me some. Give me some. What are your family names, the church names? Four Square Gospel. Congregational. Come on. Free Christian. Okay. And on and on. Uh, Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, Orthodox Orthodox, Orthodox Church of America, Amen. not so Orthodox. Amen. Yeah, Cyril Chaldean got a new name. Our, we have a new name. We decided to name ourselves according to be a name that would say what we are instead of what we stem from historically, because we're not even in the same location anymore. Where did the Church of Rome stem from? Where did the Church of Rome stem from? Huh? Jerusalem. But when they were in Rome, what they call themselves? Church of Rome. So they didn't continue to call themselves what they came from, although that's okay. It's true that that's where they came from. So we don't call ourselves Cyril Chaldean anymore. We call ourselves the Evangelical Apostolic Church of North America because we believe that says what we are. And if you want to know why, I'll tell you, you know, in conversation sometime because that's not what this morning is about. But only to say that churches have different names. And I don't think God minds that any more than he minds our family names. Just because I'm a McCullough, that doesn't separate me from everybody. It makes me to know that my family is the McCullough family, in particular, the Alex McCullough family. That includes Alice, Mark, Winston, Mary, and now Kenny Ramirez, and who knows who else later. But I, I realize that that's who we are, and we have a name that indicates who we are, but that doesn't make me separate from people. We're still all part of the family of man, and in God's holy family, we have nominations, names. And then we have subnames, denominations. God doesn't mind that at all, as long as we remember the commonality, that we're all part of the family of God. He doesn't mind that at all. We don't need to be self-conscious about that. I know that people have trouble with denominations, Sometimes just the concept of it. And so there are two ways to deal with that. CFO deals with it two different ways. Some people in CFO leadership think that we should never mention it and we should pretend that it isn't there and we don't want to know about it because if you do, you're going to get into fights. Beloved, I think that expresses very low faith and estimate in our integrity in Jesus Christ. I love hearing about the churches that our people are from. I don't get into fights about it. I just know mine's better. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I mean, we can't all belong to the best one. <laughs> but see, that's one approach. Pretend that it isn't there, and maybe it'll go away, and it won't rear its ugly head. Don't open the, the basement door, and the gorilla won't run out, see? <laughs> But I, I don't think that that's I don't think that's healthy. If I if I meet Fran, I want to know, you know, 
that his last name is Wilcox. That's interesting to me. See? Interesting. And that doesn't separate us. So the other approach is in CFO or anywhere else in life is what church do you belong to? Tell me a little bit about it. And when you're doing that, I'm hearing about Jesus. That's another aspect of him. It's, a, it's another little cut on the diamond that reflects from a different angle and a different piece of light comes through and it just sparkles. It's nice to hear. But I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood. That's talking about us, but still, who is they? Matt, the title is, Who Are They? <laughs> and I have 30 minutes left. <laughs> and that's all. <laughs> I should confess to you that I was planning to complete my preparation for tonight's talk while June was speaking this morning. <laughs> But I realize now I have to stay awake throughout the entire talk. <laughs> I always think it's good for me to stay awake during my talks. <laughs> Otherwise, it could be embarrassing. Don't you think so? Paul says, Paul says, for we have not human enemies but uh, spiritual enemies of darkness and, you know, powers of evil. And he's talking about demonic reality. There's a whole kingdom that has a hierarchy. You do know that the kingdom of heaven has a hierarchy, don't you? Is anybody afraid of that word? There's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. They're all equal in essence, but there's a hierarchical order. Nothing wrong with that. I taught school for 26 years, and some of the people I worked with were called principals. Others were unprincipled. <laughs> and I never once thought that I worked for a principal who was a better man than I even when it was a woman. Not a better person than me, but I respected the position. That's the principle. God says all, uh, Paul says all authority is from God. Authority is not something to frighten people. Misused authority will frighten you. Also, if you sin against authority, you will be afraid of authority. Paul says the authorities uh, are there for the lawless, not for the lawful. The ones who are obedient, there's no problem. You don't even have to deal with the authorities. But the authority is there to watch over for those who don't follow. And God has an authority. He has archangels, angels, and all the company of heaven, doesn't he? You don't really think that Michael and uh, Gabriel and the one who used to be Lucifer, you don't think they're the same rank as the rest of the gang, do you? They're archangels. They're angels. Then they're cherubim and they're seraphim. And they're all part of the heavenly bunch. And they're the saints that have gone on. And, and, you know, there they are. They're sitting in the stands. We're out on the stadium ground. Olympics is brownies compared to what we're doing. They're cheering on. We're surrounded by so great a cloud of saints. And they're just cheering. We don't beat one another. All we got to do is finish the race. Like that guy who couldn't win and was favored to win and just came hobbling and his dad helped him. Well, all we got to do is keep moving. As long as you keep moving, they can't hit you. <laughs> Just stay out of range of the cabbages. Just keep moving. 
at the right time, God will get the hook. <laughs> we don't have any enemies. Well, where does that leave us then with they? Fear sees they. Love sees we. Yeah, but they're not born again. Gosh, that's really uh, surprising. I thought everybody was born again. So what? Well, you can't talk to them the same way. Well, then what do you do? Beloved, if you don't love them, I suggest that you fear them. Now, you, you check yourself out. And the ones you don't love, you find that you are got a little anxiety about it. But when you love people, you're not afraid of them. I'm not afraid of people I love. You can't love and be afraid at the same time. Well, I'm just shy. I'm just sort of afraid of people. Start loving them. Don't try to get rid of your fear. Everybody close your eyes a minute. Trust me for just a second. Close your eyes. Okay. Now, when I say go, I want everybody to be sure not to think of pink monkeys. Go. Now, come on now. Don't think of them. Don't think of those pink monkeys. See? All right, you can open your eyes. Point made? What you fight, you get sucked into. Don't spend your time with that. Jesus gave a little bit of time to Satan, and he said, that's enough. Get behind me. You know how he got behind him? You know how Jesus got Satan behind him? Just like this. The way you get Satan behind you is just turn your back on him. The conversation is over. You don't get equal time. You get nothing. I don't listen to you. You don't plead your case. You're not the other lawyer. You're, you're the criminal. And you're not innocent. You're guilty. Satan's guilty. And he doesn't get life for that. He gets death. But forever. We're going to die... But though we die, yet shall we live. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me shall never die. Though you die, yet shall you live. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That means that when we die, we're not going to perish. Perishing and dying are two different things, aren't they? You die and you're home. You're home. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. How does it work? I don't know. It works good. It works good and it works well. But love sees we. What's that thing about the guy who drew the circle and kept me out? But I drew a larger circle and took him in, you know. That's the way it goes. I grew up in a home with a mother who was a very refined lady from Columbus, Mississippi. And a good old boy from Pickens down in the Delta, my daddy. They loved each other and they were expressive of it. <clears throat> there was a lot of hugging and kissing in our family, and I know it did me good. Uh, brothers and sisters didn't hug or kiss. My brother and I never hugged each other. But parents hugged each other, and they hugged their children, and the children hugged them back, and we were kissed. When I was a teenager in high school, I was still getting kissed by my dad and my mom. That's good. That's good for you. That makes we out of they. <laughs> but there were some cultural aberrations. And for every group of people who were supposedly different from us, every different race, every different religion, every different social strata, 
every different financial level, there was a derogative name, a derogatory name. I learned all the names. I learned to call them by those names, not to their face because you wouldn't want to hurt them, but, they were, but we just referred to people by derogatory names. I don't need to name them, do I? It's too shameful to mention. That's one of the things that God heals. He healed that one quickly in me. Even as a little boy, I knew there was something wrong with that. I used to go and prefer to sit in the back of the bus. The beat is better. We had fun. And they liked the little white boy that sat in the back. No credit to me. You know, when you're a kid, you don't know what you're doing anyway. And while I would do that, I would still use derogatory names when we weren't together. Because you just, you're a little recording machine. But God heals that stuff, and he makes we out of they. This was not the first time that this event happened. I was in New York City, just walking along, minding my business, under a orange-colored sky, wham, bam, alakazam. What happened? I was in Midtown, and I was down there for some reason. I don't remember now what it was in Manhattan. And I, and I stop, had to stop at a, at a corner to cross an uptown, downtown avenue, probably 2nd or 3rd Avenue, maybe around 50th or 60th Street. And as I was about to go across the street, the light changed. And when the light changes, the cars move. It's a challenge, you know, to, to walk around in Manhattan. And so I drew up short and waited for the light to change. And as I stood, my eyes gradually focused directly across the street. And here was a man with a beard down to his chest, filthy, in rags, just one of the worst looking things I'd seen. And there he was, and I thought, my God, look at that. Oh, I wish I didn't have to look at that. That's disgusting. That, what an insult to humanity. And the light changed, and as I set my foot on the ground, suddenly I realized that he and I were one, and that all people and I were one. That's a serendipity. In other words, that's God doing something in you and on you and, and, and through you by total surprise. Bow! There was a revelation, and I walked past that man in tears, loving him like he was my brother. Part of the family of man. I don't know if he was part of the family of God. He certainly didn't look like what I would think that part of the family of God would be. I think if he knew he was part of the family of God, he would have felt better about himself and maybe reflected it. I don't really know. I didn't think any of that. All I thought was he and I are one. That's the revelation of God. That's the love of God. Who are they? It's getting to where I'm having trouble finding they anymore. It's we. It's we. Another example, that was after I knew the Lord. Still needed that particular healing. <laughs> Don't you love them all? <laughs> Don't you love your enemies? The ones who despitefully use you and speak poorly of your name behind your back and to your face or whatever. Don't you love them? Before I was a Christian, I was playing the, in a, uh, a roadside uh, dinner and nightclub on the Sawmill River Parkway near Elmsford. Been there for a long, long time. I found out much later that some of my favorite musicians had played there in years gone by. And I was working steady there. I, 
uh, I think Thursday, Friday, and Saturday uh, with Nick Calby, the bass player. And anyway, uh, we, there was a group, piano, bass, drums, and me, and we worked there steady. And, and um, I was trying to lose some weight at that time. And so uh, I wasn't drinking. I was doing drugs, but I wasn't drinking. And um, so I was drinking a lot of water. So we, we played a set, and I went back in the kitchen to get some water, you know, to put the fire out. And, uh, you know, get some ice water back there. And there I'm standing there in my tuxedo, and this guy comes over to the sink, and I got out of his way. And I said, hey, man, what's happening? How you doing? He says, oh, hello. And I noticed he was, must have been from the Caribbean islands from the way he spoke. And I said, well, um, how long you been here? He said, oh, I've just been here for a week or two, a short period of time, whatever he said. And I said, well, how are things going? He says, well, he says, things don't go very well for people like me. And suddenly something came over me. I just lost it. I looked at him and I just fell in love with him. And the compassion of Christ was there. I didn't know that's what it was. I didn't know what was happening to me. I said, I know, I know. And I loved him. And that man grabbed me and hugged me and fell to his knees in front of me and hugged my knees and was trembling. I didn't know what to do. At that point, I lost the love and compassion and became self-conscious. And I thought, what's the matter with this man? What's he doing? You're not supposed to do this stuff. What's it? It's like he's worshiping me. You know, I wish he wouldn't be down there doing that. And I looked around the kitchen, and it was just as though E.F. Hutton had spoken. <laughs> Everybody was frozen, staring at this scene that was taking place, and I was part of it and wished I wasn't. And there he was, you know. And I thought, what am I supposed to do now about this, you know? How long is this going to go on, you know? And so, you know, I waited a while, figuring it's going to, you know, run its course and subside and hope it won't be too long. And... So finally, I just sort of reached down. He had sort of, that had sort of happened, and I reached down and took him up to his feet, and I said, be cool, man. You know, mellow out. Everything's going to be okay. It's going to be all right. You're a good man. And I walked back into the, the main room to do the next set, totally shaken. I was rattled. I was unraveled. I didn't know what to make of it. I never told anybody about it because I didn't know what to say about it. But I never forgot it. And don't you believe that he must have sensed the love of Jesus Christ, even though I didn't know. I didn't know the Lord or that that was his love. I didn't know what happened to me. I didn't know what hit me. But don't you think that he must have thought that the love of God was there? Or that even if he didn't know what it was, it's what he needed more than anything else in life. And it was the opposite of what he'd been getting, evidently. And I worried about him because he had done this in front of the other employees. And sure enough, next week he wasn't there and I never saw him again. I imagine they fired him. But wherever he is, today I know he's never forgotten that and I hope that he knows I've never forgotten it and I don't know what family he's a part of but if you know people from the islands there's a real good chance he's part of the family of God and was then and he may have recognized more than I did where was they there wasn't any them his face was blacker than mine, but that didn't make any difference. He had a different hairdo than I did, 
That didn't make any difference. He was in his kitchen clothes and I was in my tuxedo. That didn't make any difference. God has a way of getting rid of they and making we. And it's important for us to know who God is. It's important for us to know who we are in Christ. And it's important for us to know who they are. And beloved, we can go a long way toward making we out of they. And until we love the lost, they don't want to hear our message. If we're afraid of them and intimidated and think that we don't know how to say the message, well, for God's sake, learn how to say the message. You don't have to be a preacher to be able to tell something that's real. Just learn to say it. Study the script a little bit. June writes her talks. When she reads them, I'm not conscious that she's reading them unless I decide to look the way a speaker does and, and see how is June doing these things. I'm learning a lot from June. She just puts it there and she just stands there and says that stuff right out. And nobody has any trouble understanding it. It's clear as a bell. And anybody can do that. It doesn't mean that anybody will become you know, one of God's preachers. But what it does mean is that if you know how to tell somebody how to fix a flat tire or how to get the dog food in the dish, you know, learn how to say the message of the love of God in Christ Jesus who makes peace between us and God and one another. However you're going to learn to say it, you've got your own way of doing it, but prepare it. Be, be shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Learn how to say it and fall in love with everybody. Fall. Fall down. Fall on your face before God. And let his love tear you up. And men don't like to lose their composure. We like to be in charge. That's the reason you don't see many men in church. They're still trying to be God. It's part of our culture. It's part of our culture. It's a little easier for women because they're getting the short end of the stick usually anyway. They're, they're you know, they're, they're man's help mate and that's right from God, but that role helps women to, to, you know, to be a help instead of trying to be the big cheese. And it's harder for men because they think they're supposed to be the big cheese. We think we're supposed to be the big cheese. Big boys don't cry. That's a fallacy. A man that will respond to the love of God with holy tears is a better man. I don't know how an honest man could be in touch with the love of God and not be undone. Woe is me. I told you how Tommy Tyson treats people. I'd like to be a good man like that. Well, I'm going to give you another, another list today. How should we treat people? If they're, if they're ever going to be, realize that they're we and decide that they want to become we, it's going to be because the love that we have for them and because of the clear message that's given to them verbally as well as who we are to them. It's the goodness of God that brings men to repentance. How shall we treat them? Let me read a passage. It's in Galatians chapter 6. And I'll read verses 7 through 10. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that also shall he reap. <laughs> For if he sows to his own flesh, well, he who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. 
But he who sows to the Holy Spirit will from the Holy Spirit reap eternal life. And let us not grow weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. So then as we have opportunity, let us do good to all men, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. Why are we fighting people? That's, that's the biggest fake out going. They're not our enemies. People are not our enemies. God created people to love each other, whatever their name is or their, their religious belief. It's demonic spirits that we fight against and how they influence people, but it's not the people that we got anything against. We love people and stop dangerous, damaging actions. That's all. That's what we're to do. That's the reason revenge is no good. That's the reason vengeance belongs to the Lord, not to us. We're killing ourselves when we kill people. They're us. How can we kill ourselves? How shall we treat each other? We'll always take opportunity to do good to all people, to all men, it says. That means human beings. Do good to all people. Don't polarize. Don't say, well, you don't know what they did to me. Boy, I'll never forgive them. And, and not only that, I'll, I'll fix them. You shouldn't have done that, Louis. I'm going to make you offer you can't refuse. I got a vendetta for you and your family. Oh, give me a break. That's what you do when you're a kid. Grow up. Grow up. Love people. Don't even it out. It never gets even. It never did on the playground. I'll fix you for that. Ba-boom. Ha-ha, look what you did to me. Huh? You gave me a ba-boom, I'm going to give you a tatui. See, then I'm going to give you a little foo-foo. And I'm going to give you a little mmm. Uh, so when does it, it never gets even. Because the last guy who got his lick in, the guy he got it in on figures, hey, that's too much. I'm going to get even. And then he's going to get even, and he's going to get even, even. No, nothing ever gets even. We're not able to, to ration out justice. We're not just. We're not just because we're not merciful. Blessed are the peacemakers. Sometimes you have to engage in some heavy-duty self-defense. But the point is to make peace, not to get even. So how shall we treat all people, and especially the household of God? Are you ready? Raise your hand if you're ready. I just want to know if you're awake. Okay. All right. That's a pretty good percentage. The rest of you just sleep on. <clears throat> now you know who you are. See? You're the body of Christ and individually members of it. And there's nothing better that can be said about anybody. Because all of us need group identity. If we don't have group identity, we don't feel safe. That's the reason you got gangs in schools. Because media has told us we don't have families. Media has told us we have a generation gap. How that could be, I have no idea. Because children are being born every minute. What is the other generation? What, what are they talking about? That's a fraud perpetrated by Madison Avenue to create two markets that are polarized and flatter and intimidate them both and create new markets. That's all that is. It's a lie from the beginning. There's never been a generation gap and isn't now. It's only children growing up and individuating and learning to break away and become their own adult people. And we can help them to do that. You're not supposed to keep them in the nest. You're supposed to help them to fly. And then they'll want to fly back to the nest. Nothing wrong with that. That's not a generation gap. That's life. How did I get in that cul-de-sac? <laughs> <laughs>
wasn't bad, though, was it? I hate it when they help me. I'm looking at the old clock on the wall, Matt. So we need group identity. And if you don't get the right kind, you'll choose the wrong kind. There's just no doubt about that. Everybody wants it, except occasionally you'll come across a very strange, hurt person who is a loner, a lone ranger. You got them in the church, you know. You got some of them in leadership and others just hidden away in there. But almost everybody, well, everybody needs group identity and almost everybody wants it. You're the body of Christ. Americans don't understand that. They think that, uh, what do we got, about 50 people here? Let's say 50. Say you got 50 persons here. So we all come together and now we're the body of Christ. Fifty ones all in one place. That's the way the American mind thinks. That's not a congregation. That's an aggregation. Sometimes it's an aggravation. <laughs> That's an aggregation when you get fifty ones together and you got fifty ones together. When 51s come together and add up to one, that's a congregation. That's coming together, con, congregation. You understand what I'm saying? When we say we, we don't even think of we. We think of each of us together, a lot of us. There's just one us, not a lot of us, one us. That's the body of Christ, one. Yeah, but man, you're taking away my identity. No, I'm not, because you're the body of Christ and individually members of it. And everybody needs their individual identity. We all crave it. We'll, we'll, we'll uh, walk over people to assert it. We'll try to get people, please, somebody notice me. I'm me. Look at the way, look, see how I am? I'm, I'm like the rest of you, but not exactly. I thought sure you'd say amen. <laughs> so we are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And how shall we treat one another? And how shall we treat the rest of the world that we can begin to sense the we that we need to? Here comes the list. Uh, the, the scripture references are here, but I won't give them. I just want you to hear this. Listen to this. Love one another, mutually depend on one another, be devoted to one another, outdo one another in showing love, rejoice with one another, weep with one another, have the same mind toward one another, don't judge one another, accept one another, counsel one another, greet one another, wait for one another, care for one another, serve one another, bear one another's burdens, be kind to one another, forgive one another, submit to one another, forbear with one another, encourage one another, build up one another, stir up one another, be hospitable to one another, minister gifts to one another, be clothed in humility to one another, don't speak evil against one another, don't grumble against one another, confess your faults to one another, pray for one another, fellowship with one another. Remember one another. That's in the inside of the cover to our telephone, our church telephone directory. Who is they? It's just us. Let's make it so. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit.
Amen.